It's gobsmackingly bananas, says one leading scientist, responding to global temperatures hitting new records in September. And it is a big jump. The high temperatures have driven heat waves and wildfires right across the world. This is Greece, where wildfires are still burning. That, of course, after the hottest July on record, the hottest August on record, and a summer of scenes just like this in so many countries in Europe, in Asia and in North America. Well, last month, the Earth's average temperature was 16.38 degrees Celsius, according to the EU's climate service. That's half a degree more than the previous record registered in September 2020. And it's the largest jump in temperature ever seen. Scientists say 2023 is now on track to be the warmest on record. Well, earlier I spoke to our climate editor, Justin Rowland. If you look at it against the average temperature for September, it's 0.93 degrees Celsius above the average. That's almost a whole degree. And I think when we look at these statistics, we've got to remember this is a global average. So we're averaging temperatures across the entire globe. Normally, you'd expect them to move by a fraction of a degree between, uh, between years, between comparable periods in a year. So this really is a very significant uh, reading. And as you say, it comes against the backdrop of the hottest summer ever recorded in the Northern Hemisphere. As you say, in July we had the hottest day, the hottest week, then the hottest month ever recorded. August was the hottest August. Um, and we think, as scientists think, July was probably the hottest month for 120,000 years, so since before the last ice age. I'll ask you about the drivers in a moment, but in terms of immediate impacts, I mean, we've seen heat waves and we've seen months of wildfires, haven't we? We certainly have. I mean, Hot, dry weather obviously dries out the kind of, uh, you know, uh, vegetation, which then, if there is a fire, doesn't necessarily cause fires. Once there is a fire, uh, you tend to get more intense and longer-lasting fires. So we see this phenomenon, as you mentioned, of places like Greece, and I think it's also true in Tenerife today, that a fire that started burning in the summer has reignited, grow burning underground, often in peat and things like that, has re-emerged and is burning once again. Really difficult to fight these big fires that we've been seeing this year across the world. Canada, big the biggest, largest area burned uh, in the country's history. So really significant fires this and year. And we saw the smoke from that even reaching New York, those pictures from a few months ago. Now, I mentioned drivers, uh, it's CO2 and El Nino, presumably the, the principles. Two separate ones, yeah. Let's do El Nino first. El Nino is a weather fluctuation in the Pacific Ocean. The winds change slightly, and instead of drawing cold water across the ocean, it, it well, hot water is encouraged to well up by the, by the wind, uh, uh, and that then releases uh, heat into the atmosphere and drives up global temperatures. El Nino started, this fluctuation began early this year. We're expecting it to peak uh, sort of now, November and December, so it hasn't yet peaked. So although it has delivered some heat to the atmosphere, um, it alone does not explain these exceptions. In fact, climate scientists are saying they expect next year to be even hotter than this year. So El Nino is part of it, but it's not the only thing. You're absolutely right to identify carbon dioxide as the other big driver. Carbon dioxide emissions continue to increase. So this year has seen record carbon dioxide uh, uh, re releases into the atmosphere. But the good news is that last month, the International Energy Agency, which is a kind of global energy watchdog, it said that on the basis of its estimates, it thinks fossil fuel use globally will peak in 2030. That's a really significant finding. Coal, oil and gas will peak and begin to decline from 2030. Now, if that's right, then we will still see significant uh, climate change because of the emissions that we're emitting at the moment. But we'll begin to, be to turn the corner and begin. the world will be moving at least in the right direction. Well, that's where I wanted to take you to, because uh, at what point do be does it become impossible to make a way back from all of this? Uh, Carbon is a stock, so that when we release carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, it hangs around for hundreds of years. Uh, the physics are well understood, so we know how much carbon dioxide will warm us to 1.5 degrees. At current rates of emissions, we're just a few years away of reaching that. The 1.3 uh, limit on pre-industrial temperatures was set because it was reckoned to avoid the worst effects of climate change. Looks like we're likely to breach that. 
But um, I mean, there are technologies that can draw carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, but they are very expensive. And doing them on the scale required to kind of turn the global temperature concentrations of CO2 to an extent that we'd reverse climate change is still a huge technological challenge. Not necessarily impossible, but a really big ask. And we need to change the economy of the world to focus money on doing that if that's what we wanted to achieve. The easiest, cheapest thing now is to try and reduce emissions as quickly as possible. Justin Rolat, around the world and across the UK, you're watching BBC News.